Good evening, everyone. Apologize for the delay. Um, I have some technical difficulties with my computer, um, but I have everything up and running now. So I like to welcome everyone to my uh, my live. Um, before I get started, uh, wait a few seconds. People can log in. I want to log in. So yeah, um, it was supposed to start at seven. Technical difficulties, but I'm here now. So um, thank you guys that are tuning in. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, um, it's Urban Farm Sister. The link's right there in the uh, banner. If you'd like to become a patron, you can also uh, um, subscribe to be a patron on my Patreon. Uh, the funds that you supply, it keeps this content coming. It keeps my channel on my YouTube as well as my Facebook. Um, it'll provide financial support for both of those uh, accounts. Um, if you don't want to use Patreon and you like to, you know, contribute via Cash App, you can do that as well. Um, my Cash App is Nadia Ruffin. So we're going to get started since we're already running behind. And today we're going to talk about this Asian giant hornets. Um, you know, the title of my thing is it just an invasive species or is it an entomological warfare? We're going to go to we're going to I'm going to go through explaining what all of that is uh, throughout this presentation. So again, thank you guys that are tuning in, and I'm sorry for the delay. All right, why is it not going forward? All right, for first of all, I'd like to thank my uh, contributors. Um, people have given to my channel, either through PayPal, Patreon, Cash App. So my newest contributors are Michelle Legrand, Pamela Ruffins, and Kim Edwards. I thank you guys for contributing. Again, if you'd like to contribute to this channel, you can do so via PayPal, uh, Patreon, or Cash App. And um, I, I said, I'll have the links up a little bit later, but I wanna really get into the uh, presentation since we're already behind. All right. So a little bit about myself for those of you that do not know me, because I noticed this uh, uh, video was shared a lot of times. Um, so about myself, my name is Nadia Ruffin. I'm located in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm an entomologist, which is a person that studies insects. I'm a scientist, a farmer, researcher and an educator. Um, I have uh, a bachelor's degree from the Ohio Department. I'm sorry, for Ohio State University. Um, my focus was animal sciences, pre-veterinary medicine, and I minored in entomology there. I also have a master's of science in entomology from the University of Nebraska. I'm an owner of a um, small urban farm here in Cincinnati called Kiwi Produce. Uh, on that, I, what I did was I purchased an empty lot and I turned it into a farm. Um, I grow crops there, I teach from there. I also have bees. Um, I have chickens I raise and I teach people about how to become self-sustainable using you know, small areas of land. I'm also the founder of Agri-Academy Inc., which is a research institution that I created that teaches about the agriculture um, industry as a whole, as well as we carry out agricultural uh, research projects and things like that. Um, I'm co-owner of Agri-Academy Labs, which is a new um, venture that I'm getting into. Um, basically, we're gonna offer lab services for um, uh, biotechnology, entomology, and also automation. Um, I'm, or like I said, I'm an urban farmer. I grow in hydroponics and also in soil. And I teach beekeeping and, you know, how to keep poultry and other small animals on a farm. Um, and, you know, in a residential or maybe in an urban environment. I have years of experience in floriculture. My family owns a flower shop here called Blossoms Florist. It's been in existence for almost 42 years. Um, like I said, I have a background in veterinary medicine uh, as well as medical research. Um, before I got into all the, you know, farming and the agricultural stuff, I was really interested in research. Um, so I've worked at the Ohio Department of Agriculture, worked at the University of Georgia, the Ohio State University, and uh, the University of Cincinnati, working on various research projects and things. I was also um, a disease investigator 
uh, for Hamilton County Public Health, uh, which is located here in Cincinnati. Uh, and there I would do uh, disease um, investigations, uh, outbreak investigations and things like that. So that's when you heard me talking about, you know, a lot of COVID-19 stuff and all that. That's what I would have to done if I was still in that position. <clears throat> Oops. So um, just a little bit from last week, because we talked about mosquitoes last week. Um, and I had two homework assignments that no one submitted. So I'm just going to put them up here again. If anybody wants to answer these, they can do so. Um, the person with the best answer, they will have their um, uh, information. They can actually read their answer on live uh, on my broadcast, which will actually take place on Sunday again. Um, like I said, this week I had had to take a break. So I had to you know push everything to today. Um, but last week's question was, West, Western equine cephalitis is a disease transmitted by mosquitoes. What mosquitoes can transmit this, this disease? What type of microorganism causes WEE? And what animal does the microorganism come from? What are the symptoms and where are the most cases of this disease seen? And what is the fatality rate? The second question was, heartworm is transmitted by mosquitoes. What is the name? The science, what is the uh, name, the scientific name of the parasite that causes heartworm and what animals serve as a host to that parasite? So if you like to answer these questions, like I said, you can still do that. Um, and um, you can send that answer to urbanfarmsister at gmail.com. That's my email. Um, and the best answers will actually be, uh, you know, uh, they'll actually get to read their answers and their responses on my live next Sunday. So today we're going to talk about uh, why this presentation is necessary. We're going to talk about what is entomology, uh, what is a native introduced and an invasive species. We're going to talk about order Hymenoptera, why Hymenopterans are important, talking about the Asian hornet, its life cycle, its distribution, the concerns, and then we're going to talk about entomological warfare, the different types, and how this pertains to this hornet, and uh, what do you do if you think you found a hornet nest. So, hey, Travis. Yeah, I'm late. Technical difficulties. Hey, appreciable assets. Yep, you were first. Um, Shanika, how you doing? All right. So why is this presentation necessary? Um, it's to educate the masses about entomology, why this hornet could be a more of an issue as it pertains to our food supply chain. And I want to try to dispel some fears being created throughout the social, uh, social media as well as through the news. I also want to educate about the importance of bees, wasps, and hornets in the ecosystem. And I want to remind people that mosquitoes are still the insect we should still be uh, to be our main concern, our main focus. You know, this wasp showed up in an isolated area, but, um, you know, mosquitoes are widespread throughout this country and they spread disease every year. And they they kill millions of people across the planet every year um, with the diseases that they transmit. So we should always be concerned about mosquitoes before we get caught up in this other stuff that pops up. So entomology, what is that? It means the study of insects, their relatives, and other invertebrates. So some other invertebrates that will fall under entomology are annelids, which are worms, uh, other arthropods, which includes the insects, spiders, ticks, centipedes, and millipedes. It also includes mollusks, things like snails and slugs. I'm an entomologist and I'm also a scientist. I educate people about insects and I also research and study them. When I went to graduate school, my focus was medical entomology, but I found people didn't know anything about any insects. So I really fall in a lot of these categories that we're going to talk about real quick. So entomology, it, it broke it off into many branches. There's insect ecology, insect morphology, insect pathology, insect physiology, insect taxonomy, insect toxicology, industrial uh, entomology, medical entomology, uh, biological control entomology, post-harvest entomology, forensic entomology, forest entomology, and crop protection entomology. Today we're going to focus on insect ecology. Um, the reason being, um, these particular uh, wasps, you know, they're going to, if they take hold and they come in and are able to establish a population, they're going to affect that whole ecosystem wherever they are. Um, so insect ecology is the scientific study of how insects individually or as a community interact with the surrounding environment or uh, ecosystem. 
Um, so there's different types of uh, ecology that it can be studied. So there's trophic relationships. So that's just some examples are like insect plant interaction, prey, predator prey interaction, uh, parasite host interaction, uh, mutualistic association, pollination ecology, uh, uh, the eco ecosystem function. Then we have, we have population ecology. So we talk about um, demography, we talk about life histories, and then we have things like community ecology, where it's uh, interspecific and inter, uh, intraspecific um, interactions between insects and, and in the environment, diversity and stability and things like that. So uh, insect ecology is, is, is a huge discipline and there's entomologists that fall into many branches of this. They just specialize in this. You know, I touch on insect ecology, but I'm not a specifically an insect ecologist. Like, yeah, you have to know, like, if you're dealing with certain insects, where they are, where they come from, uh, how they affect where they where they originate from, if they're brought somewhere else and things like that. So that's what we're going to talk about as it pertains to this wasp. OK, so what is a native species? A native species are plants and animals that originate and live in an area without any human intervention. Um, some example, some arthropod examples are the periodical cicada carpenter bees and wolf spiders. So these things are all native to the United States. They, you know, they were, they've just been here forever, as long as we've known. Um, so they were not introduced, uh, not by humans, but per se, they've just been here. This is where they live. This is their native to, you know, the, the, the ecosystem is, it's, it's built around them. So introduced species is, uh, are non-native plants and animals um, introduced to an ecosystem intentionally or accidentally, usually by humans, but not always the case. Uh, some things like weather systems that move through like a hurricane or a tornado, they can pick up insect species and they can, you know, disperse them somewhere else they wouldn't normally be. Um, so that's a way of insects are introduced to a new area that may not have been there before. Um, some examples of this are stink bugs, Honeybees, people don't realize honeybees are not native to the United States. The European honeybee came from Europe and they were brought here in the 1600s by uh, European uh, colonizers. Uh, they brought the bees as well as, you know, humans and all other things over here. Um, and they, you know, set up their populations here because they used them in Europe. They brought them here for the honey and things like that. Um, but honeybees are not native. So just remember that. Also, the Asian lady beetle. I don't know if you guys, people, they, this, this um, lady beetle gets a bad rep because what it does, um, they were brought here initially by um, scientists to combat aphids on, um, you know, crops. They eat aphids and things like that. The problem with these particular lady beetles is that they actually overwinter in people's homes and they can also bite. Uh, so people have looked at them now as pests, even though. They were brought here by humans to serve a purpose of, you know, controlling aphid populations. And they still do that, but they also um, cause problems, which is what we're going to talk about now. We talk about invasive species. So invasive species are ones that it's currently established as a population in a region where it has not uh, has no occupation before. And it's doing so stressing and displacing native species and are disrupting the ecosystem. Some examples of these are honeybees. You know, honeybees are introduced in the 1600s by Europeans. When honeybees came over here, they actually displaced native bees. They took, you know, they were competing with native bees for the flowers and the pollen and the nectar. Um, so there were a lot of native populations that, you know, were either reduced because they were not able to feed and get the food or, you know, have the, the nesting spots and things because honeybees came in and they disrupted that whole ecosystem. Asian lady beetles, you know, their populations have taken over. They've set in residence here in the United States, but they've also competed with native lady beetles that were here. Um, and they will eat uh, native lady beetles. They'll eat each other. Um, they'll eat other insects. So they, you know, kind of disrupted the ecosystem. And, you know, last week we talked about the Asian tiger mosquito. This was also an introduced, uh, insect that has now become invasive. It has set up population here in the United States. Um, and we know that, you know, from last week, we talked about the problem that has created is that they are able to transmit many diseases. Um, so, you know, introduced species, 
they can be introduced for a good reason, but they be, they become invasive and they become a problem. So any questions before I start talking about Hymenoptera? So Shanika said, I'll answer this week. I worked on it, but I've been spending time with my niece and prepping the garden, so I haven't had a chance to type it up. That's fine. Um, that's good. Um, we also have another question at the end of this uh, this live, so that's okay. <clears throat> um, all right. So if you have questions, you can ask them, and I'll answer them as I see them pop up on the screen. Um, so order Hymenoptera. This includes bees, wasps, yellow jackets, hornets, ants and sawflies. Uh, all of the insects in this order undergo complete metamorphosis, which means an egg, larva, pupa, and then they uh, turn into an adult. They have chewing, lapping mouth parts. Um, almost all of them are social to some extent. Some wasp, um, they, they can be solitary, but they still, you know, will congregate together when it comes time to mate and things like that. Most females in this order are equipped with stingers. Um, while males do not have stingers, this is, this is true throughout all hymenopterans, bees, wasps, um, ants, and sawflies. Their bodies, uh, they have a, a thin, that's why I say thin, not thin, thin waist connecting their thorax and their abdomen. Uh, they have two pairs of wings. They have six legs. Um, there's over 150,000 living species of hymenoptera that have been described, um, but there's still many out there that they have not even found. Um, in addition, there's over 2,000 that have gone extinct. Um, and a lot of these have gone extinct for many different reasons. Some of them are human related. Some of them, you know, are because they were in such a, you know, closed, dense area and something may have happened in the area like hurricanes, volcanoes, tornadoes, all types of stuff can wipe the populations out. Um, but humans have contributed to a lot of these things disappearing and going extinct within the last 250 so years. All right, so why hymenopterans are important. Collectively, the order hymenoptera are important to humans and the ecosystem because native and introduced species, uh, we rely on them for, as pollinators of wild and cultivated flowers. So we rely on them to pollinate our, fl our flowers for plants that we consume, uh, as well as plants we use for other, other things. Um, wasps, this includes yellow jackets and hornets. Um, they are predators and parasites of destructive insects. So, you know, wasps, especially yellow jackets, hornets, they get a bad rep, um, but they are beneficial. They will feed on things like caterpillars that are out in people's gardens and on the farm. They will, you know, uh, parasitize. There's parasitoid wasps that lay their eggs on things like caterpillars. The eggs hatch and then uh, the larva, you know, will destroy the uh the caterpillar, it'll kill the caterpillar, and that you know they they can be used as biological controls when you're when you're farming and when you're gardening outdoors. Um, honeybees, in particular, uh, we use them uh, for their honey, their wax, royal jelly, propolis, and they're also used for pollination services. Hey, Shay B, how are you? So the Asian giant hornet. So it's bring us to our our main topic of the day. The scientific name is Vespa mandarinia. Um, their common name is Asian giant hornet, or people call them murder hornets. Um, they're native to temperate and tropical East Asia, South Asia, mainland Southeast Asia, parts of the Russia Far East, and um, I'm sorry, Russian Far East, and has recently been found in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they prefer to live in low mountains and forests while almost completely avoiding plains and high altitude climates. <clears throat> so Cheryl Wright said, good to know wasps have a purpose. Yes, they do. Um, you know, they, a lot of them become aggressive in the fall. Uh, because uh, their food sources are depleted. You know, if they feed on other insects, a lot of times during the fall, most of the caterpillars and things that they feed on are either, you know, they either turn into adults um, and they're, they're either butterflies or, or um, moths at that point, or they have gone and pupated. And so they don't have access to their food. 
And so what they do, especially yellow jackets, they turn to humans uh, as a source of food uh, and nectar. And as a result of that, uh, yeah, people end up getting stung and things by them. Uh, you know, people usually get stung by yellow jackets, but they blame bees. I can bet you nine out of ten times if people that have been stung, unless you physically work with honeybees, most of the time you've been stung by a yellow jacket. Um, and I try to explain that, uh, you know, that you did get stung by a bee. You actually got stung by a yellow jacket. And I try to make the distinction of the two. And I hope I'm very effective at explaining the difference. Um, but yeah, most people get stung by yellow jackets. So appreciable asset has a question. He said, uh, don't some wasps eat spiders? Yes, there are some wasps that, uh, actually, uh, that's the host that the uh, wasp uses to lay her eggs in. Uh, so what she'll do is she'll sting the spider that will stun it. She'll take it back to her nest and she'll lay an egg on there. And then her larva will actually feed on that, that spider. Uh, a lot of times the spider isn't dead. It's just in like a, a paralyzed state. And so that larva will hatch. Uh, the egg will hatch. The larva will come out and feed on that. And then it'll uh, emerge a new um, uh, wasp from that spider. Um, there's some there's some wasps that only feed on cicadas. Uh, so those summer cicadas, they're they're prey for them. Uh, there's some of them that are specialists. They are like they only feed on specific things. And then there's some that, you know, are generalists. They'll feed on multiple things. Um, when we get and talk to more about this uh, Asian uh, giant hornet, you'll see what they specialize in uh, feeding and killing. So F. Carson said, are you supposed to stay still so they won't sting you? Yes, um, you swinging on them uh, will aggravate them. And the thing with wasp uh, is that they can sting you multiple times. When it comes to bees, they can only sting you once and because their stinger has this barb on it and it pulls the whole stinger out and it has like this venom sac that keeps pumping venom into you. Wasps are different. They don't have that barb stinger, so they can sting you multiple times. So, you know, when you upset one, they send out a lower pheromone that they're being attacked. And then sometimes that pheromone, if it, if they're close enough to where their colony is, it'll, it'll uh, send that message to the other workers in the area. And then they will all swarm you and they'll keep repeatedly stinging you. And that's the problem with wasps, not just this giant uh, hornet here. All wasps respond that way. It's just some of them are more tolerant than others. Um, and we'll find out, like I said, well, if we talk more about this one, um, you know, things that will uh, cause them to actually want to sting. Hold on, gotta switch windows. All right, so the Asian giant hornet is the world largest hornet, world's largest wasp. Um, the queen can be about two inches or 50 millimeters. Workers can be 35 to 40 millimeters, which is 1.4 to 1.6 inches. Drones, which are the males, they can be about two inches. Uh, females have stinger. They have the longest stinger on any hymenoptera. It's about 0.24 inches. Males do not have stingers. And like I said, this is true throughout all hymenopterans, bees, wasps, ants, all of those. Males do not have stingers. Regardless of the sex, the, ornit, the hornet's head is a light shade of orange and its antenna are brown with a yellow orange base. Its eyes and ocelli which are simple eyes that sit on the top of the head, uh, are a dark brown to black. The abdomen alternates between bands of dark brown or black and yellow or yellowish orange hue, which is consistent with their head color. Um, so I tried to find a good picture of what they look like because I, I have people already now sending me <laughs> uh, pictures of hornets and, and, and wasps and, and things that they found and they're asking me, is this it? And I'm like, no. First, I ask them, are they in the area that they claim they have seen them? And they'll say no. And then I say, well, no, that's not it. That that could be a number of different hornets. I mean, a lot of these things look similar, um, but they're not always that particular insect. All right. So the Asian giant hornets life cycle. Um, these hornets differ from other hornets because they actually make their nest underground or in hollowed out, hollow, hollowed out tree trunks. Um, 
usually hornets make their their nests up in trees and they'll get they can get very huge um other wasps like yellow jackets they do make what are called subterranean or underground nests um the asian hornet uh life cycle begins in april when queens come out of hibernation and begin feeding on maple sap um Fertilized queens will build nests and lay both fertilized eggs, which will turn into workers, and all workers are females, or they'll lay unfertilized eggs, which are drones. So in the Hymenoptera order, the queens make their own males by laying eggs that are not fertilized. Um, so when these eggs hatch, they turn into males that are drones, and the drones' existence is only to mate with queens. They don't do any work. They don't forage. They don't take care of any of the, the larva or anything. They're just there. If something happens to a queen, to mate with a new queen and keep the colonies going. Um, so in this case, uh, we only have one queen here. Um, if something happens to this queen, the colony would die because they're not like bees. But the males are there for when the, the in the fall, when the queen lays eggs that are going to turn, turn into queen uh, you no know, virgin queens, those males are there to mate with them so that they can overwinter, fertilize, and then in the following spring, they can start the whole cycle over again. So this cycle, I didn't really get into the cycle because I didn't want you guys, you know, focusing on that, but basically it has six steps to it. Uh, but most of it is, is that they, they emerge in April, the fertilized queens, they start going out foraging, um, building nests, laying eggs, and she'll create a nest or a colony that has about 40 workers. And those 40 workers will uh, tend to the um, uh, larva. The drones are only there, like I said, for mating, mating purposes. And the mating, again, will occur in the fall. Those virgin queens, they will become fertilized. Not all of them get fertilized, um, but they'll all go over winter. And then the following spring, they will, uh, you know, wake up and start the whole cycle over again. <laughs> William Klein Brown says, yay for the males. Boo for the males. They just love there taking up space and eating up the food and stuff. Because the workers have to take care of the males as well as the queen and the larva. So the Asian giant hornet, their diet, um, they're dominant predators and where they are native to, uh, which means um, for the most part, there's nothing else that really dominates them as far as in, as in the insect world uh, and, and when they're in their native uh, lands. Um, so they feed on other insects, but they have a, a specific, you know, desire to feed on honeybees and praying mantises. Um, the way they go about uh, feeding on honeybees, they will invade honeybee hives um, and they will wipe out an entire colony and feed honeybee larvae to their actual larvae. Um, the workers cannot eat whole prey, but they can eat juices. So what they do is they take, say they catch an insect, they'll chew it up in their mandibles. And uh, as they're chewing it up, you know, juices, all, all the insects, you know, hemolymph, which is their blood, is released and things. And they, they, they feed on that. They lap that up. And then the meat part of that insect or the body, they actually feed that to the larva. The larva can actually eat flesh. So the larva are the real predators uh, because they can actually eat the flesh. And then the, the, uh, the workers, like I say, they have to eat a liquefied uh, diet of, you know, of those insects. So the Asian hornets, um, they're, they are aggressive, but Asian hornets do not seek out humans, but they will attack if provoked or their nest is attacked. Um, so, a lot, like I said, they, they prefer forest environments away from humans, but humans have kind of, you know, put themselves in harm way as we, you know, we increase our urban sprawl into wooded areas where these things are native, where we're systematically invading their space. And as a result, we're clashing with them. Um, like I said earlier, they can sting repeatedly. They're not like a bee. So their stinger, like I told you, is the largest stinger of any hymenopteran. Um, they produce a powerful venom in their sting. The venom contains a neurotoxin called mandar mandarotoxin. 
and in high doses, it can cause organ failure. So they release a lot of, of venom when they sting you because they have a big stinger and they release a lot of venom. Um, most people that die from this particular sting, they are already allergic to bee stings to begin with. And so they end up going into anaphylactic shock. Now, if you get multiple stings, like say you're walking through the woods and, and you stumble upon where, you know, you're walking by a, a hollowed out tree where they've made a nest and you hit that nest and you trigger them to start attacking and you have multiple um, hornets attacking you at once, then uh, it doesn't matter if you had the anaphylactic shock or not. What will happen is if you get too much of that venom, it will start to shut your organs down, uh, your liver and your kidneys. Um, will be are some of the organs that will shut down. Um, you have organ failure. Um, while one single sting may not be fatal, multiple stings can be fatal. Annually, forty people are killed by this hornet in their native lands. Um, so you know they're called murder, uh, murder hornets. Um, there was a scientist I forget his name, but he described the sting as like a uh a nail, a heated nail being driven into your to your arm. Um, it's, it's a really painful sting. Um, and if you are allergic to bees, you should be the ones that are on high alert because you're going to get a lot more venom than what you would from a yellow jacket or a bee if you're stung by one of these. But like I said, they do not seek out humans just to attack us. Now, if you come across them and you're swinging on them and things like that, that is going to trigger their defense and they're going to sting you um they're going to sting you repeatedly so just know that <clears throat> so the concern here in the united states is um as their their presence here can have you know a huge impact beyond just you know um you know humans being killed or you know hurt by these by these wasps so in september 2019 the British Columbia Ministry of Agriculture confirmed that hornets were found in Vancouver Island in Canada with a nest having been discovered and subsequently destroyed in the city of Nanaimo. They think they were introduced to the region accidentally by overwintering queens and cargo either from Europe or Asia. So Europe has been dealing with uh, these wasps as well. I'm sorry, wasp hornets. I'll call them hornets. Um, but they are, they're just a large wasp. Um, they've been dealing with these as well. Um, and they were introduced uh, a few years ago um, from Asia to Europe. Um, but they're thinking they got to you, to this side of the world from some cargo. They think, they're not really sure. So in December, 2019, the Washington State Department of Agriculture confirmed a report of a dead specimen on the U.S. side of the border adjacent to Vancouver. So I have a map here showing you where Vancouver is in conjunction to where Washington State is. The first report of this species in the United States, this was the first report of the species in the United States and very close to the September sightings. So the September sightings were in Vancouver and then, you know, Washington State is right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on the map. Hold on, let me switch green so I can use the pointer. Okay. So I know this map is kind of small and you guys can pull it up on uh, Google. This is where I got it from. But this is Vancouver Island and this is where the first uh, right here is where the specimen and the nest was found. And then over here in um, uh, Washington State, the actual, um, <clears throat> I didn't put the county on here, but the actual, um, you know, the first sighting was located around this area. So, you know, there is concern because they don't know how long it's actually been in the state and if it's been there long enough to establish a population that's where the problem lies um so what they did is that they made this announcement in april 
I'm sorry, this month, or last month, um, the authorities in Washington asked members of the public to be on alert and report any sightings of these wasps, which are expected to become active in April if they are in the area. So this is what triggered all that stuff on, you know, the news, Facebook, uh, Twitter, all of that. Um, because they had found that one specimen there. Now they're wanting since they had found it back in December. Now they're wanting people since this is when they become active. Because remember, I told you their life cycle. They, they, they wake up in around April and they start foraging and they start building their nest. And then the, uh, the, the queen will start laying eggs so she can make workers. So this is when they'd be active now, April, May. Um, so, you know, they're wanting people, if they see them to report it, they'll send someone out to verify that it is that that particular wasp or not. And then they go from there saying, you know, yes, we have a, an established population or, you know, they're trying to establish a population or we found nests or things like that. The problem is, is that, you know, they found nest in September in Vancouver, but that doesn't say when the insects actually got there. They could have been there in 2018 because September is the end of the season. So, you know, you find the nest, they've already been, if they've built a nest already, they've been, you know, they've been there since April of that previous year because they were able to overwinter and start again. So, yeah. So I'm thinking they're, They've been here a lot longer, so they probably have established populations. And also, they may be in other areas that we don't know about yet because nobody was really looking for them. So the concern with this with this particular hornet is our honeybee industry in the United States uh, is is threatened. Honeybees are heavily dependent. We heavily depend on honeybees uh, for pollination in California of our crops like almonds. Um, but California, I don't know if you guys know this, they they produce the majority of the foods and things that we eat here in the United States are all mostly grown in California. You know, some of it's grown in Mexico and there are other things that come from other states. But California is like the agricultural Mecca of the United States. I don't know why they chose, I, I know why they chose the state because of the climate and things, but there's so much other land that can be utilized to grow a lot of the stuff that, you know, is grown in California. But as a result, you know, if something happens in California, you know, we have those fires, you know, they're, they're always in a drought because they're kind of, their climate is kind of desert in places and things like that. If something happens in California and we don't, you know, create a system in other states, our, you know, food chain <laughs> is going to be depleted. So the introduction of this, this particular hornet on the West Coast is, is concerning because if their populations have, you know, made it out of Washington and have made their way down to California, we're in trouble because, like I told you, they can wipe out an entire colony of bees in a few hours. All it takes is 10 Asian giant hornets to find a, a, a honeybee colony, and they can go in that colony and they can outpower that colony. And they can kill 30,000 bees in a few hours. So they can wipe out a whole hive, kill them all. What they do is they go in, um, they're bigger than the bees. The bees try to sting them. They can't sting them. Um, they can't penetrate their, their, uh, you know, their skin. And so what happens is these, these wasps come in and they just decapitate everything in there. And then they take the larva back to their, to their, uh, um, their nest and they feed that to their larva. Um, <clears throat> Now, there is a bee in Japan, the Japanese honeybee. Uh, they found a way to fight against these particular uh, hornets. What they do is they build like this cluster, and I have a picture of it right there, where they'll cluster around one of those uh, scouting worker uh, hornets that comes to the nest to, to decide if they're going to go back to their uh, nest and say, you know, I found a beehive colony. We all need to go out here so we can take it over and, you know, wipe them all out. Um, so what they'll do, they make this cluster around these these hornets and they systematically cook it. What they do is they heat it up and they they cause the body temperature of that hornet to increase to where it'll kill it. If that scout cannot make it back to its uh, colony and she can't alert her sisters that, you know, there's a hive here, 
that honeybee colony is saved. So these honeybees, you know, living with these particular hornets, you know, for forever, probably, they've created this defense mechanism. Now, the problem here in the United States is honeybees here do not even see this, you know, hornet as a predator that they are not native to this to this country. So honeybees have not been able to even build up any build up any defenses to it. Also, there's no predators here that have identified this hornet as, you know, food. Even over in uh, Asia, it doesn't have a lot of predators that, you know, will feed on it. I mean, the thing is huge compared to, you know, other hymenopteran. So a lot of things are not going to contend with it. And then it has that, that you know, that horrible sting. So a lot of things are just going to leave it alone. Um, so there's no natural predators that will feed on it. Now, there are some people that actually eat these hornets. Um, so I guess humans can be a predator. Um, but in reality, there's no insect predator or no other animal predator that will actually feed on them. And so, you know, honeybees here in this country have not developed this defense mechanism against them. So if they invade a honeybee colony, you know, it's going to wipe it out. Uh, decreased honeybees will mean a decrease in pollination, which means a decrease in the food supply chain here in the United States. So this is why this is this thing is a problem far beyond, you know, them stinging people and, you know, people possibly dying. Like I told you, on average, 40 people die in those Asian countries that this 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 hornet actually lives in. So that's a very small percentage of people that die. Um, honeybee populations here in the United States are already, you know, threatened. We have a lot of issues of why they're threatened from the varroa mites to colony collapse disease to. Uh, other parasites, um, you know, them being used for that pollination service, that, that's causing problems because what they do for the pollination service is they take hives of bees, they take millions of hives of bees, they pack them up from the East Coast and they take them over to the West Coast and they help those California farmers pollinate all of those crops. So if all those honeybees are taken from the East Coast and they're put over there on the West Coast to co pollinate crops, and then you have this hornet come in and wipe out like a whole bunch of those colonies, then we're in trouble because then you won't have any bees to bring back to the East to pollinate the crops that need to be pollinated here. So the, it, it's a lot of problems that have been created by humans um, that, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that, that are going to either affect honeybee po populations you know, number one, the introduction of this this wasp was probably most likely by humans, which brings us to our next thing we're going to talk about is entomological warfare. So anybody have any questions before I talk about entomological warfare? Uh, F. Carson said females are always on the job. Yep. The females are always doing the work. Males, yeah, y'all just, just be slipping. Y'all be doing nothing. Um, Tamon, is it pride nice? You fast, do they produce a colony so they move in swarms? No, they 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 nest in an area. Um so they create a colony in that nest. So they'll have about 40 workers, you have a queen, you'll have some drones there, and then you'll have larvae. Um and when I say they swarm. They only swarm if they're feeling threatened and then they'll swarm a whatever the threat is. So if it's you standing there and they feel like you threatening them because you're swinging on them or you're throwing rocks at their nest or whatever, they will swarm you and they will repeatedly sting you. Um, it's not like a honeybee swarm where they, you know, in the, in the spring, females and uh, uh, the, the queen the new a new virgin queen will emerge she'll mate with the drones that are present uh and then she will swarm take some of those workers with her and start another colony no it's not like that um they uh so they're not like the bees in the sense of swarming like that now this, this their life cycle is a year so what happens is that that queen that built that colony she will die in the fall but she will have laid uh, eggs that will um, that will turn in those queens, and that those queens will mate in the fall, and they will over those new queens that she had laid while she, uh, you know spring summer. They will turn into 
uh, workers and uh, they will actually turn into queens that will mate with drones and those drones will, I'm um, sorry, those queens will overwinter and then they'll start that process over again in April. No, uh, so Deidre has a great question. And I'm gonna, I need to address this because people think this is just that easy. So in the beginning, I talked about introduced and I talked about invasive and I talked about native species. So Deidre wants to know, can we introduce the Asian bees to the United States? No, that would not be wise to introduce the native, bee, uh, the Asian bee to the United States. Um, just because they can fight this particular hornet, uh, that does not mean we want to introduce another species into our ecosystem. We've already introduced, you know, the European honeybee. We have all types of insects and things that have been introduced to this ecosystem that have caused problems. So you introducing the Japanese uh, bees or the Asian bees into this country will, you know, create more competition for the native bees. So these Asian bees are gonna use the flowers that are here. Also, you, you, you don't even know if they'll be able to be introduced. They might not like this climate, you know, some of their particular flowers that they like, they grow over in, in the region they are, they're not growing over here. So they may have problems adjusting to the flora that's over here. So um, uh, it it is, uh, not wise to introduce another species because you know we're we're only introducing them because we they have the ability to fight off this wasp but what is that going to do as far as you know our honeybee industry those are not bees that we normally use for our um you know our honey there's certain there's certain breeds of bees that we use and so just introducing more species that's that's the problem we can't we kept introducing things and it, just, it goes beyond just insects. We introduced, you know, uh, predatory animals that were supposed to control other animals. They control that animal, then they start feeding on other animals or they competed with native animals. And now that the native animals don't have the food source that they need, or, you know, they've been, the native animals have been wiped out by this other animal that was introduced. So you do not want to introduce new species. That's not wise to do. Appreciable assay says, wow, some of us men are on our grind. Yes, you are. <laughs> All right, any other questions before I go on? So Denise Jackson said, what about the killer bees? Can they fight them? Um, again, Probably not because they've never been exposed to this particular type of predator. Um, killer bees, they call them Africanized killer bees, but they were made by crossing a bee from South Africa with the Italian honey bee uh, from Europe. Um, and they created this hybrid. Um, so the reason they created it because they, uh, <clears throat> they were able to, um, they produce a lot of honey they were able to they were able to survive in the region that they had took them to so they were actually uh raised in central america or was it, it was a, I can't remember if it was a south american country or a central american country but they were brought over here in the americas and they were going to use them it might have been in brazil or venezuela or one of those countries uh as you know as honeybees like 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 we use honeybees here in the united states the thing is, is that they they were a lot more aggressive. They produce a lot of honey, but they were very aggressive uh, when it came to you, uh, you know, going in the hive and doing hive checks and taking honey and things out of there. Um, so, you know, this bee, they are aggressive, but they don't have that same, you know, defense mechanism that those Japanese honey bees do. Um, I know what's probably going to happen if this if these wasps, you know, take hold. What they're probably going to do is create hybrids with those Japanese um, Japanese beetles. They're going to make them with another type of, I'm sorry, Japanese bees. They're going to make them with another type of bee and create a hybrid. Uh, but that's, you know, 
that's probably going to be done. I'm not going to say that is going to be done, but you have to think about what happened when they created the hybrid with the Africanized bee and the, uh, the Africanized bee, you know, it created a, a, a bee that can make a lot of honey, but became aggressive. So when you, know, you start mixing these, uh, you know, genetics and stuff together, you might not produce a desirable organism. And like with the Africanized bee, what happened is that that colony escaped from that lab and that's how they became evasive. They accidentally were released from them escaping and they were not able to contain them. And they, you know, they just spread their colonies all the way up uh, to Mexico and then into parts of California and parts of the Southwest. Um, so yeah, they don't really have that ability to make that cluster uh, like those Japanese beetles, I'm sorry, Japanese bees. Uh, so, you know, it would take probably, you know, some years before they established that, you know, they could even do that unless they took those Japanese bees and mated them with some Italian honeybee or something and created a hybrid that had that, you know, that genetic code to, you know, once we see these wasps, we need to attack them. All right, any other questions? All right, so now we're going to talk about entomological warfare. <clears throat> uh, entomological warfare is a type of biological warfare that uses insects or other arthropods as weapons. Uh, three types of entomological warfare. The first type is it involves purposely infecting insects with a pathogen and then releasing them over enemy territory. These insects then infect humans and animals through bites. So an example of that, uh, some insects that have been used for entomological warfare are things like ticks, fleas, um, mosquitoes, all types of things that, you know, will feed on humans or animals. Uh, when we think about warfare, we, only, we always want to think about, you know, just human, human life and, you know, things like that. But warfare, it, affect, it can affect a lot of things. You know, if it's something that's going to affect animals, it could be animals that we use for food or animals that we use for, you know, work and things like that. If these if these uh, insects are released and they can transmit disease that will wipe those out, that can really affect the population. The second type is when insects are used for destructive destruction of agricultural plants, uh, uh, depriving the enemy of food sources. Uh, so things like the Colorado's uh, potato beetle. They were dropped on fields to wipe out fields. Um, you know, say some herbivore, herbivore type insect is dropped on a field and they feed on leaves and they wipe the whole crop out. Um, and you know, we have to think about again, um, <clears throat> if we're using animals and things for livestock and you you release some insect that can um destroy that livestock, whether it be like screw worm or something it could kill those li like livestock and things like that which then depletes food sources for people the third type is it involves the use of non-infected insects such as wasps and bees for a direct um uh attack on opponents um so if you know if you guys after after this presentation you can go read about it uh there's a lot of times when war like you know one side would use they would they would find a, a hornet's nest or something and they would you know throw it over where the the enemy was and those you know throwing that over and destroying that nest upset those hornets and they attacked anything that was moving um so there's things like that that uh can be used as weapons so how does this pertain to the hornet so um the type two, which was the agricultural threat, and as well as the three, could be very relevant in this case as it pertains to this hornet. Now, you know, I'm not trying to create any type of conspiracy theories or none of that. I'm just, I'm just looking at, you know, how things have played out and where this thing showed up and things like that. So they still haven't figured out how this hornet got here. Um, it's just speculation that it came in on cargoes, overwintering. They think it's some overwintering fertilized queens, but they're not even really sure. They don't know if there's other populations in any other areas. 
um, because nobody was really monitoring for this until somebody spotted one in Washington state. They were monitoring up in Canada, but they were not really monitoring down here until that person turned in that dead specimen. And then they, you know, they found a nest and things. But at that point, how long had they been here? If they were able to build nests, were, were other, you know, wasps able to go out? Other queens, were they present and they able to go out in other places that they just haven't found them yet? Why were these wasps found along the West Coast? Um, that's that's kind of troubling, especially because I talked about California and how that is our food supply here in this country. Um, and thinking about COVID-19, the first case of COVID-19 showed up uh, in that same region. Uh, it came in at, uh, it was called uh, Sohamish County, uh, which is not far from where the original wasp was found. So I'm not saying that the hornet, wasp, whatever you want to call it, is the vector for the virus. I'm just saying that it could have been used as a biological, uh, you know, attack. You know, it could have been, we could have had the virus released on us and these wasps could have been brought in at the same time. Um, just throwing that out there, and I'm just I'm gonna be watching this whole thing to see like if they find other populations, other places. If they don't, you have to start thinking like, okay, we had a lot of stuff going on prior to you know COVID nineteen showing up. We had tariff wars, we had you know things going on with China, uh, North Korea, all types of stuff. Um, these countries in the past have used you know, biological warfare on people, in particular entomological warfare. So it's not far-fetched. The United States has done the same thing as well. Um, so just be mindful of that. And I'm going to be watching this because uh, it's entomology related. You know, I get excited about my insects and things. Um, so, you know, just be mindful of that. Just know that it showed up in Washington state, the same state that COVID-19 showed up. There's speculation that, you know, COVID-19 has been here a lot longer than they, they've said it's been. I'm thinking it's been here since at least October of 2019. You know, this first hornet showed up in Vancouver in 2019, September 2019. Then you have, you know, COVID-19. Now they're saying it might have been here December. Like I said, I think it was October. And then in December also is when they found this specimen of a hornet uh in washington state so you have to just think about all that um not trying to scare people i'm just trying to get people thinking like okay what is really going on here and why 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 now like why why is this showing up now it's kind of weird <clears throat> all right so any questions about the hornets their life cycle hymenopterans entomological questions anything like that now, what do you do if you think you find a hornet's nest? First of all, I want you guys to not approach it or touch it. If you live in Washington State, you need to contact the Washington State's Department of Agriculture. They will send someone out and they will be able to identify the hornet as, you know, yes, this is indeed a hornet. If you find a dead specimen, you need to have that specimen sent to the, Ohio, um, sorry, the Washington State Department of Agriculture so they can identify it and say, yes, it is. And then you tell them where you found it so they can come in and inspect and see if there's actually a colony living there. So if you do not live in Washington state at this time, these wasps are not in any other state that they know of. Be mindful of that. But um, if you find a hornet's nest and they may look like these hornets, I am telling you there's lots of hornets. I told you there's 150,000 species of hymenopterans. So, a lot of them look similar. Some of them, you know, can be kind of big and things like that. So I don't want you guys, you know, assuming that, oh yes, that is it. But if you if you're if you're, you know, kind of nervous, um if you're if if you think it might be, I want you to call someone. I do not want you to try to approach the 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 the, the colony. I don't want you trying to spray anything on it. I don't want you, you know, trying to take it down or, you know, dig it up and things like that. Now, so I, since I told you these, these things, they, 
uh, nest underground or they nest by, you know, hollowed out tree stumps and things like that. One thing of concern is people that are cutting grass. Um, is that 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 um, lawnmower motor can be upsetting. Those vibrations can be upsetting and they can cause them to swarm and attack. Because this happens with yellow jackets because I they, they nest underground as well. Uh, and a lot of times people will encounter a yellow jacket nest uh, while cutting grass and then they'll get swarmed by yellow jackets because they had that lawnmower go over top of where their nest is. Um, so, but if you think you might have hornets in your in your yard or you know wherever, and you need to have someone come in that knows what they're doing. Either you need to contact your local department of agriculture. If they won't send anyone, maybe contact an exterminator, a beekeeper, or someone that's qualified to identify that insect that's present. Um, I want you all to know all bees and wasps are not the giant, uh, I'm sorry, the Asian giant hornet. So do not go out on a rampage killing everything that you see in sight. I don't want y'all going out spraying raid that because that creates other problems too when you start spraying all this insecticide and all that because you create this fear in your mind uh, for something that's probably not even what you're trying to kill. Um, if you find a hornet's nest, do not spray that nest directly. This will aggravate that colony and they will attack. And so you do not want to do anything that's going to actually cause them to attack. Candace Denise, she said they're already here, question mark. Um, well, I just explained that they're, they found a specimen in Washington state. Um, they're wanting people that live in Washington state to be on alert and let them know if they find any more specimens or if they find nests or anything like that. Uh, because they became, if they are there, they became active back, back in April. Um, that's when they, uh, I went over the whole life cycle. They, they wake up, uh, from hibernation in April. Um, and the queens go out and they try to find spots to nest. So they're wanting people that live in Washington state since they found a specimen in Washington state to be on the lookout. Um, right now, Washington state is the only state that they found a specimen. That does not mean that they're not in other states, but this is the only state that has a confirm confirmation that there's those uh, wasps are actually there. Now, I'm telling you, if you live in another state that's not Washington state, nine times out of 10, it's not going to be there, but I'm not going to rule it out that it is not there. But if you find hornets, I don't want you approaching them because uh, all hornets will sting if they are provoked. Um, it's not just this one. Um, I want you to, uh, you know, contact somebody that can actually identify what's present and things like that. And if it's a hornet's nest, you know, if it's this particular hornet, it's going to have to be destroyed. If it's another type of hornet, they may be able to relocate those hornets to another location. But I don't want you going out because, you know, if you're spraying things or you're agitating the colony, that will cause them to actually attack you. You don't want to get stung because they can sting multiple times. <clears throat> so Deidre Dree Duncan said, is the American honeybee the only bee we can consume honey from? Yes. Yeah, so the American, so the, the European honeybee, the ones that are that we use here, they have different. Um, they created different, you know, strains or you know hybrids where they cross honeybees and things. So there's like, mm, I think it's about eight different ones that they use. But those honeybees are the um, only ones here in the United States that produce honey. Now there are some stingless bees that are down in um, Mexico that you know, produce honey. And there are some over in Africa that produce honey. Um, the, but those are stingless bees and they're not allowed, they're not allowed to introduce those into this, uh, you know, to this ecosystem. Uh, so yes, honey bees are the only bees here in the United States that we get honey from. Mark Cyrus said, what natural predators does the hornet have? Dragonflies perhaps. Uh, here in the United States, there's no natural predators. Over in Asia, I have not found any natural predators that really, you know, take them on. Um, dragonflies could be one, but they're generalists, so they're not going to just specifically feed on that wasp. They're going to feed on whatever insects are present. 
Shanika Bedford said, I think it was October also. I know several people who said they were the sick, sickest they've ever been months before the media announced the COVID. Yeah, that's why I said October, the same thing. I was talking to a lot of different people and they said they were, you know, sick around that time. Uh, <clears throat> Deidre said, you stated that they may do a hybrid with the Asian honeybee. Um, does doing that not cause a greater impact on other native species in the environment? Yes, exactly. That's why I said they may or may not do that. Um, if if these hornets become a problem, they may do that to put those genetics into the bee populations here. But you have to think when they made that hybrid of the Africanized bee with the Italian bee, they created that more aggressive bee. bee. So you have to think about the implications of creating these crosses, what what type of organism is that going to produce? And again, introducing a new bee into this, this ecosystem is going to threaten native populations because they're going to be competing with this new bee along with, you know, the, the European honeybee. Now their uh, native bees have to compete and then they have to you know, even compete with each other. So there's only so many food sources. And you got all these bees, so yeah, it's gonna it could cause problems in the in the ecosystem. No, the uh, the venom is not formic acid based. That's formic acid is made by fire ants. Um, fire ants do fall under this same order Hymenoptera, but they do not. The venom does not have um, formic acid in it. It's a neurotoxin. The actual venom from these. Uh, wasps. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right. So like every week, you guys have homework if you choose to do it. And this is this week's homework assignment. Let me pull up the window so I can read it better. All right. So of these two questions, I want you to pick, I mean, of these three questions, I want you to pick two. Uh, the first question is, throughout history, there have been instances where insects have been used as weapons. The United States carry out, carried out their own experimentation with using insects as weapons. I would like for you to research and write a report telling me what were Operation Big Itch, Operation Big Buzz, and Operation Drop Kick. So if you choose to do that question, I'd like you a paper and tell me about what, are, what were those different operations. Uh, number two, Japan used entomological warfare on a large scale during World War II in China. What exactly did they use and roughly how many people died because of that method, their methods that they used? So I want to know what insects or what arthropods they use, what um, they use the, the type one uh, uh, da, da, da. Entomological warfare, where they actually infected, are they 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 infected insects with disease? So I want to know what diseases they infected the insects, which insects they use, and then how many people they actually killed with their methods. And then the third question is: I already mentioned stink bugs and Asian lady beetles, but tell me about another introduced uh, species, whether it be intentional or accidental, insect or arthropod that have become invasive. Tell me if their introduction was accidental or on purpose. If uh, if they were uh, on purpose, why were they brought here? And how has their introduction impacted the ecosystem? So if you choose to do the homework, um, I want you to cho choose two of the three questions and then send those answers to me, uh, to my email, urbanfarmsister at gmail.com. Um, so that's the end of the presentation about the, the wasp, but I have some few questions here I'm going to answer in a second. Um, but I want to talk about the website, the school website where all this information is posted. So the questions will be there. They'll also be posted in the description of the, uh, videos. The video will show up on Facebook as well as, uh, YouTube. Uh, after it renders on YouTube, it's taken like 12 hours now for it to actually show up after the live has finished. It's not my, I, I don't have any control over that. Um, but if you want to watch it again uh, immediately, you can go to Facebook and watch it on my Facebook account, which is also Urban Farm Sister. So if you have any questions, 
after I answer these questions, you can always send me an email. Um, you can uh, send the questions uh, via, you know, social media, Urban Farm Sister on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. So you can contact me on there. So now I'm going to answer some more questions that we have over here about the bees. So Ace Ace said, someone reported that fruit bats eat these Asian hornets. Uh, they possibly could. Um, I'm not sure. I didn't see that. Um, again, if they find them out, if the fruit bats are big enough and they can overtake them without being stung, then yes, they probably would eat them. Um, but, you know, Asia has larger fruit bats than we have here in the United States. So, and again, fruit bats here, they have not seen these as a prey. So, you know, they're not even... They're not even used to seeing these things, so they don't even see them as food. It's kind of like, like the stink bugs. Most predators here do not feed on stink bugs because they are introduced species. They they've never seen them before, so they don't see them as food. Um, and then you know you have to think about these hornets. They can sting, and they have very toxic venom. So most animals are not going to contend with them anyway. More information on the chemical constituents of the venom, please. I don't have any more information. You can research it, like I told you in the in the presentation. It was called uh, uh, I forget the mandar mandarin toxin. So you can look that up. Um, but it does not have formic acid in it. Uh, like I said, that's produced by uh, the fire ants. Appreciable Asset said, what are some of the main foods that we would lose if these ornaments popped up in California? The number one thing we lose is almonds. Um, uh, things like squash plants, um, even tomatoes and peppers and things. Uh, even though they can self-pollinate, they still need bees to come in and pollinate. And a lot of times, uh, a lot of native bees be visit those type of plants. Um, these particular hornets, they will also eat native bees also. I didn't even talk about that, um, but they will eat native bees um, along with the honeybees. Um, things like apples, um, peaches, pears, all types of things that, re that require honeybee pop uh, pollination, they will be you know, reduced or eliminated if we don't have those insects to come in and uh, pollinate. But almonds, Almonds is the number one crop in California. 80% uh, of the world's almonds come from California, the world, not just the United States, the world. Um, there's just thousands and thousands of acres of, you know, almond trees that the majority of these bees are brought from the East Coast to the West Coast to pollinate just those almonds. Um, and if the honeybee populations are eliminated, then the honey, the, uh, the almond uh uh, industry would be de decimated. <clears throat> I heard a bat is their natural predator. That could be. I'm not sure. I didn't see that. Cheryl Wright said, thank you. This is very informative. I mean, be bats could be a natural predator. Um, at this point right now, in Asian countries, these um, hornets are actually they're on the endangered species list because of humans coming in and uh, taking over their nesting sites. Like I say, they, they nest underground, but with urban sprawl, when we set up our homes and things, we eliminate, you know, soil, eliminate trees if they're using a tree. So as a result, um, they, uh, you know, humans can be a natural predator. Um, not just wiping out the hornets, they wipe out a lot of other things as well. Um, but with the bats, again, bats are generalists. They're not going to be a specialist. They're not, they're not just specifically going to feed on this hornet. Um, you know, hornets can hunt at night. Some of them are active at night, but for the most part, bats are going to be eating things at night that are active at night. So that's things like moths, um, any other type of flying insects that are active at night. Uh, so you got to think about that. And bats are generalists. They eat whatever they're, you know, when they're sending out the echolocation and it bounces off of something, that's what they're going to eat. They're not going to say, oh, tonight I'm just going to feed on all hornets. They're not going to do that. They're, that They don't do that. 
they, they, they're going to feed on whatever is available um, in that area that they are in. So it could be bats and it might not be any, any hornets in that area, but the next county over our next country over or whatever, those bats might not live there. And those, those hornets are, you know, just there. So you can't, you can't put, you know, human characteristics on animals thinking like, oh yeah, they're a predator. They're only going to specifically eat this, this, this thing. They're not doing it. They don't do that. That's not how animals, you know, operate out in the wild. All right. So Ace A said that fruit bats are used in Japan to battle these hornets. Uh, Ace A said, thank you, sis. He said, wow. California is America's bread basket for real. And it really doesn't have to be. California does not have to produce everything. Like we have all this land and opportunity in between California uh, and, you know, the other coast that things can be grown. Um, and, you know, California trying to dominate agriculture has put them in such a bind to where, you know, like I said, they, they have droughts. Um, now they have, they have all these rich billionaires coming in and buying up water rights and things like that. So it's a, it's a lot of going on in California beyond just, you know, the possibility of these wasps showing up that can wipe out our agricultural industry in that state. But, you know, adding this, this hornet to that does not help. So Ace Ace wants to know, does the Asian hornet have a contributive purpose? Because it seems like it does not. Um, like I said, they feed on other insects. They 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 have a you know appetite for bees, but they do feed on other things as well. Um, so I mean they serve as a predator in the region that they're native to. Uh predators are needed in populations to keep other populations under control. Um, if your population gets out of control because a predator's not there, then you have problems of competition and all that other stuff. So it's a kind of a checks and balances type thing. So predators have to be present as well as prey has to be present. It's it's a whole, you know, ecology. Um, you know, I, I talked about that. We, we're talking about insect ecology for this presentation and, you know, how, you know, how predators and prey interact with each other and things like that makes that ecosystem, you know, a stable one or a one that's, you know, out of control. And so predators, they serve a purpose. Um, you know, we, the reason we think they're not serving a purpose is because we utilize bees, honeybees for a reason. You know, we use them for, you know, a number of different things, pollination, honey, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but in reality, um, you know, bees do what they bees do what they do for bees they don't do that for humans we've just you know found a way to steal from them manipulate them and and use them for our own benefit but in reality you can't say like they're not serving a purpose because they are serving a purpose out in the wild to keep those populations under control so a said thumbs up thanks all right and purse person kid did the smoke deter these hornets? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if smoke deters them or not. I haven't seen anybody, you know, you know, really trying to uh, go up against them. I know when I've seen people move other hornet colony colonies, uh, even using the smoke, it really didn't calm them. Um, <laughs> it kind of just upset them even more. So I'm thinking that that would be the method that what happened here is if you smoked them, that would just upset them to the point where they would attack. Um, so, you know, in, in Asian countries, they, they do different things uh, to control the populations. If they find a, a nest, they will, you know, dig it up or whatever. They'll destroy it. They'll, you know, kill all the larva and the, all the adults and things that are there. They'll, they'll spray insecticides. They'll use bait traps and things like that. So in Washington state, they're actually setting up bait traps to see if they can, if there's any in any populations in that area, if they'll fly to the bait traps, um, these bait traps will also attract other bees and things though. So um, the traps are set up to where, you know, small bees can get out, but anything large like this hornet will get caught in there and stuck in there. And then that will give them, you know, the statistical data that they need to say, yes, we have 
you know, populations establishing here or not. Um, so there's all different types of methods that they use. Uh, you know, they're starting to resort to chemical in certain countries and stuff, but then that resorting to chemical uh, sprays and things like that can, you know, that can be devastating on the environment, on ecosystem. So hopefully it doesn't set up and establish itself here, but looking at the other insects that have invaded this country and, you know, a lot of them have established themselves, mosquitoes, the Asian, Asian uh, lady beetles, stink bugs, all types of things have established themselves. I don't want to name too anything because that's what your homework is. Y'all have to research that. Um, so Mark Timer said, you are my hero, Nadia. Oh, thanks. Uh, Ace A said, yeah, or the electric zapper. Um, electric zapper, probably not going to work on the hornets. So anybody else, any other questions? Comments, concerns. Did y'all learn something this evening? Let me know. Um, I thank you guys for coming on here and being part of this live. Um, I hopefully, you know, I've helped some people with their fears, especially if you do not live in Washington State. You really don't have anything to fear at this point in time because they haven't found, you know, any nest in any other places. Um, just be mindful that they could show up other places. If you do find a nest, please don't try to, uh, you know, destroy it yourself. Get somebody to come in and help you that knows what they're doing because you can really get hurt. Um, if you're allergic, I would definitely have EpiPens with me, especially if you live in Washington State. And you may have, uh, <clears throat> you may have an encounter with one of these things. Just have your EpiPen there so if you get stung, you know, you can quickly administer that. Um, I forgot to say that the uh, it would take about 15 stings that they're recommending that you go t t seek medical attention if you're if you you know no you're not allergic to bees. They said about 35 to 40 stings uh, could be the fatal could be fatal. So um, enough venom would come out of there that could definitely uh, you know cause organ failure. So if you're stung once, I would still go seek medical attention just to make sure. But if you're stung more than once, you definitely need to go seek medical attention so that, you know, uh, you're not going through that whole organ failure that could eventually be fatal. Um, like I said, it's also a neurotoxin. Um, when a person gets stung, sometimes people, um, it actually necrosis the skin where the sting occurred. Um, so, you know, just know that it doesn't happen to everyone, uh, but it can happen. Um, but yeah, look up, look up the toxin that is produced so you can see what's in there. Um, uh, also look at how many stings it would take to actually be fatal. Um, but that's kind of relative because it could mean, you know, a child may succumb faster than the adult and things like that. So you got to be aware of that as well as if you already have organ problems, like, you know, liver problems or kidney and things, that will probably exasperate those things and that could cause you to, um, <coughs> to you know, cause it to be fatal. All right, so appreciable asset said, Shiro, thanks. Ace A said, have a good one. Ace A said, you asked, definitely added context to be afraid, to the be afraid narrative. I added context to the be afraid narrative. What do you mean? I'm not trying to make anybody afraid. I'm just trying to educate. Um, like I say, these things are here. You guys need to know uh, what they're able or capable of doing. Um, as far as, you know, not just stinging people, you know, wiping out a whole industry, bee, bee honeybee industry. Um, and that, you know, I don't want you guys going out and killing every bee, wasp, yellow jacket that you guys find because you're thinking that it's this, um, because that's not, that's not practical. That's not sustainable. And, you know, that's not even rational to go out and kill things. Um, you guys need to be educated on what, what's even in your area. Um, you know, um, 
and you need to know the life cycles of these things. You need to know that, you know, during the fall, um, <clears throat> that yellow jackets become aggressive because their food sources are depleted. So you a lot of times I attend in the fall, you're going to get people are going to get stung by a lot of yellow jackets versus, you know, early in the spring and summer. You don't really get stung by them. Um, so, yeah, you just need to know. And that's why I try to do is I try to educate people on, uh, you know, the life cycles of these things, as well as their presence, where they are. Um, like I said, this is not even across the United States. It's in one state in an isolated area at this point. So, the you know, the the media frenzy that was created was unnecessary. Uh, they actually knew about these things back in September. And they never said anything back in September. And now they want to say something now in the middle of all this COVID-19 stuff. And it's, it was just weird. So, um, you know, just go and research uh, beyond what I've said on here. Um, and then, again, do the homework questions because entomological warfare is weird, real. They This still goes on today. Um, and, you know, that it's the perfect it's the perfect um, it's the perfect weapon because nobody's ever nobody's thinking that they're just thinking, oh, this insect just showed up. They're not thinking that this can be used as an actual biological weapon that can, you know, transmit disease or wipe out a whole crop or wipe out a whole industry, uh, you know, honeybees and things like that. So you need to just go and do further research from what I present here. I mean, I could present. I could talk about this for the next week and still not cover everything that, that pertains to this. But I want you guys to, you know, take the next step and, and, and educate yourselves. And if you have questions, you can always email me and um, I can answer them or I can say, no, that's probably not probably not right. Or, you know, uh, you know, if I find when I find out more information about these uh, hornets, you know, definitely I'm going to update you guys. I'll, I'll send it in posts and things like that. So I'm, I'm watching this just like you guys are, but I'm watching it from a scientist entomologist perspective and not from a scared citizen perspective. Um, you know, same thing with COVID-19. I educated you guys about that. I was watching that as a disease investigator and a scientist and, you know, dealing with other disease outbreaks that I had to deal with as far as like Ebola and things like that. I'm coming from a, a scientific perspective. So I'm going to get a science aspect of it. I'm not going to give a sugar coated you know, fear mongering explanation. I'm just going to tell you, yeah, yeah, these things can kill. Yes, these things are here in certain areas. And, and this is what you need to do, protect yourself. So I, if that was, you know, creating fear, I wasn't trying to do that. Um, So, yeah. And so A, A said, oh, yeah, you clarified it. Okay. Um, Krenisha. She said, you're doing an amazing job of educating us. Thank you, Kranisha. Person Kid 21, thank you greatly, sister. You're welcome. Um, Ace A said, the media is whipping people into a frenzy over these hornets. They are, and that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to dispel that. That's why I did the whole presentation about the cicadas because the media, they came out with that, talking about cicadas are coming out, and then they're coming out in huge uh, broods coming out in 2021. And I'm like, why are y'all bringing up 2021? We're in 2020. Like, why are y'all trying to create fear in people that are already on edge anyway? And so I try to come out and I just try to educate you guys on the things that are, you know, that show up in the in the news that pertain to things that I've done. And, you know, I've done a lot of stuff. So, you know, when it comes to farming, science stuff, entomology, um, uh, uh, let's see, disease investigation, all of that. I've done a lot of this stuff. You know, I don't, I don't look as old as I am, um, but I've done this stuff for about twenty years. So I have a lot of knowledge that I've acquired over the over, over the years. Mark Simer said, "What about cycle activity of the venom? It's just, it's just like any other bee venom. If you get stung by a bee, it, it, it." it it does the same thing. It's just that you're getting a lot more venom from this particular hornet than you would normally get from a honeybee. Um, so if you're stung by a honeybee or you're stung by a yellow jacket or a wasp, you're going to undergo the same things. Uh, swelling, if you're allergic, anaphylactic shock, things like that. It's just that you're getting more venom. And then this venom, because you're getting that more doses of it, it can cause organ failure. <clears throat> I 
I just saw a person sharing a mouse being stung by a hornet. They never have any context, just want to work folks up into a frenzy. Exactly. And so that's what I try to do. I try to bring people back down. I don't know how effective I am, but I, I have a few people that listen to me. Um, but yeah, that's that's the media's job. They want to sensationalize everything to keep people on edge. And you guys should have I should have learned this by now. I mean, I don't even know how COVID nineteen took the took over like it did, but it did. And now they're gonna bring up this. Um, but just remember, like I talked about last week, mosquitoes, mosquitoes, mosquitoes transmit diseases that each year a million or more people die from things like malaria, yellow fever, uh, West Nile virus, um, dengue, uh, Western equine encephalitis, Eastern equine encephalitis. So mosquitoes, they're here. They are, their populations are spread across the United States. One's capable of transmitting disease. They are there and they are willing participants to transmit disease. So you need to be more concerned about them. If you live in an area where it rained recently, you need to go outside and you need to dump containers that are filled up with water to control their populations. Because if you don't, they will lay eggs in that water. The eggs will hatch, the larva will develop. And if the temperatures are right, you can go from an egg to a full grown mosquito in seven to 10 days. So I want you guys to be more worried about mosquitoes because they kill more people and they make more people sick in the United States than this hornet has done throughout its existence. Uh, just remember that. Um, you know, so worry more about mosquitoes. Just be know that this, this hornet is here. Be mindful of that. But don't get caught up in the media frenzy. Stop sharing those stories. Like I see a story from 2013 being shared when there was a uh, an increase of stinging of these hornets in I think it was Japan, and I think 40 people were were killed during that season. And I said that's the normal death rate anyway. Um, there were hundreds of people that were injured, but about 40 died. Um, but during that year, there was a drought, and that that caused the hornet populations to actually go into human dwellings to look for prey and things because the insects and things that they fed on, they were not readily available in their particular ecosystem. So they had to go out and find them. And so they interacted with people a lot more than they normally would. And as a result, a lot of people were stung and things uh, and were killed. You know, 40 people were killed. But that story happened in 2013. But it's being shared like it's happening now. And then that's creating this fear in people. And it's just, it's just annoying. So people... Then people try to, like she just said, somebody took a, a video of a, a hornet stinging a mouse. Yes, there are some hornets that sting mice and they use mice as their, as their, uh, you know, the host for their eggs. They're going to lay their eggs in. It happens. That doesn't mean that's the same hornet. So, I mean, we got to stop with this nonsense that we do on social media where we share things that we don't even, you know, know anything about or you know everything is not an alien or made in a lab because i've had somebody tell me that too that this this wasp was made by uh it was a gmo wasp made in a lab to wipe out humans no it, it was probably here before humans even existed um but yeah just things like that and then people People that don't think latch on to that, then they share stuff like that. And then we have all this nonsense going around. Uh, it's like the 5G nonsense. So, you know, I just try to dispel some of those rumors and I try to, you know, decrease the the media frenzy and the fear and all that stuff. <clears throat> Mark said, I got stung by a large bee when I was a child and it caused me to have an amazing psychoactive experience. Okay, well... I, that could be you. I've been stung by yellow jackets and I've been stung by bees and all I've had is swelling um, and usually swelling that was at the spot of the sting and then swelling other places like other other places would swell up. When I got stung in my shoulder one one year when I was checking my bees in my colony, my shoulder swelled, it swelled up just a little bit, but then like underneath my eye swelled up. So, you know, the venom traveled and it caused that swelling in other places. Uh, tra true that on uh, mosquitoes and media does not really care. 
well, they don't care right now. When it when it was out back during Zika, Zika uh, and Chikagunya time, which was about two years ago, that was all you heard was you know Zika virus, Zika virus, Zika virus, and you know you go here, you're gonna get Zika virus, and that's all you heard. So they pick and choose what things they want to focus on. I thought this year, I knew it was gonna be some entomological frenzy after this COVID-19 because every year there's some insect that they throw in there. I was thinking it's going to be a mosquito, but this, the, you know, this hornet came out of nowhere, but I still think mosquitoes are going to make a, their appearance this year as well. Um, so just be mindful of that. Make sure you're dumping water and things to keep populations down so we don't have to worry about that. Now, if they drop populations of infected mosquitoes on us, then that's another thing we have to worry about because like I told you entomological warfare does happen. <clears throat> F. Carson said, everybody want to go viral. They don't care. No backstory, nothing. I know. That, it's just sad. So that's why I just try to address this stuff. But any other questions about this Hornet? Because I'm about to get out of here. I've been on here for an hour and a half now. It was only supposed to be an hour presentation. Um, any other questions? You can email me. What does the sting feel like? The sting of this particular Hornet? Like I said, on the presentation, I said there was a scientist that said it feels like a hot nail being driven into your wherever they're stinging. In his case, he had let it sting him in the arm. So he said it felt like a hot nail that's being driven into his arm. Um, There's a guy on YouTube, Coyote. Is it Coyote? I forget his name. Um, But he goes around. He lets insects sting him. And he got stung by one of these hornets. Uh. So you can go and watch this video and see how he responds. That tells you how painful it is. Um, <clears throat> person kid said, I wonder about the medicine, medical, medicinal research using hornet venom that's going on. Um, well, bee venom is used for medical. Uh, they actually use it for arthritis. Um, you can use bee venom to help people with arthritis uh, as well as any some other inflam inflammatory diseases. Um, so it could be used for that. Or they could, you know, they could uh, harvest it from the the hornets and use it to create some type of drugs or things. So, I mean, it does happen. They do use bee venom, uh, honey bee venom for, uh, they call it uh, um, bee therapy, where they actually will let honey bees sting. They'll take honey bees and they'll let them sting you and they'll let the stinger stay there. And it really does help with things like arthritis and other inflammatory diseases. Um, the chemicals in there, it, 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 it goes to those spots and it helps with that inflammation. All right. So we'll get out of here, you guys. Thank you for tuning in again. If you would like, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, Urban Farm Sister, youtube.com, Urban Farm Sister. If you'd like to support me financially, this channel, um, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com, Urban Farm Sister. Or if you don't want to use Patreon, you can use Cash App. My Cash App handle is money sign Nadia Ruffin. And if you uh, want to use PayPal, you can use that also. You can use the email um, Nadia Ruffin at gmail.com um, and you can uh, do it that way. So I thank you guys for tuning in. Again, this, this video will be up on Facebook and on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook probably within the next 15 minutes. YouTube is going to take about 12 hours before it shows up. Um, so again, thank you for tuning in. I will see you guys on Sunday, uh, for Sunday's YouTube live discussion. All right. Talk with you guys later. Have a good night. Bye-bye.